the subcommittee. We have a say there are any apologies. There is an apology from Councillor Mail. Thank you, Chairman. Other than Councillor Mail, I've got no other apologies for this afternoon. Thank you. Is there any declarations of interest? Here to be no. We'll now go on to presentation by the Energy Agency on the Prison Gallery's Universal Home Installation Scheme for 2013. Uh, Mr. Carr, you're ready to go. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Carr, Project Manager with the Energy Agency. I'm delighted for this opportunity to talk to you today about the Scottish Government's Universal Home Insulation Scheme and the new programme uh, for 2013 and beyond. So, plan for the next 10 minutes. Uh, I'll tell you how we how we got on with the, the UHIS project over the last couple of years, and then explain briefly the proposals for the new scheme that we expect to start in April and May. And there'll be an opportunity at the end for any questions. The Universal Home Insulation Scheme is a fund provided by the Scottish Government for free insulation, regardless of age, income or tenure. Dumfries and Galloway were awarded £300,000 in 2011-12 uh, that the Council chose to initially target in Stranraer and North Rins. Uh, it was subsequently extended to Annan and then in 2012-13 a further £425,000 was awarded uh, which enabled the scheme to be extended through Dumfries and eventually to, the whole of, uh, to be available for the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, the Council appointed the Energy Agency uh, as managing agent and we were able to secure additional match funding from a utility company, funding known as Carbon Emission Reduction Target, CERT money, of another half a million pounds, which in total over the two years has brought 1.3 million pounds of, of insulation into the Dumfries and Galloway area. So, I did come here last year, about this, this week last year, to, to present our proposals at that time. And I, I went into detail about the background of the Energy Agency. So I don't intend to spend any time on our, our history today, but in the handouts you'll see this, this slide if you want to look at what we've done in the past. So getting on to our summary of the numbers for uh, two years ago, 2011-12, uh, we insulated uh, 800 households across the region who benefited from free loft and or cavity wall insulation. Some of them received both measures. You'll see from the little table on the right that as we initially targeted Stranraer, we had, we had probably half the households who benefited were uh, from the Stranraer area. Uh, and then as we extended out to Annan uh, and into the rural area, other householders, you can see from the different villages there uh, were also able to benefit. Uh, sorry, you, I meant to also add, you can see the, the quite extensive fuel bill savings. This, we've taken average figures on what each household would save from each measure, and when you add them all together and you calculate over the lifetime of the measures, it's £2.7 million that's saved off fuel bills just from that one project. Uh, and similar high numbers of uh, tons of carbon saved. The project that we're currently running at the moment, uh, this is up until the end of March. Uh, the figures are taken to February. We've got about 1,500 measures that have already been invoiced. Uh, and you can see from the fuel bill savings that we've made that we've actually pretty much doubled uh, what we did the, the year before uh, on on less than double the, the funding. Uh, it was particularly helpful that the project was, was covering the whole of Dumfries and Galloway and we, we got, you can see from the long list of villages there, an awful lot of rural properties were able to, to take advantage of the scheme. The project's been so successful this year and we had so many applicants, we were able to go back to the Scottish Government uh, in about November and uh, submit a request for additional funding and we were able to get another £150,000 
uh, for this year's project to get even, even more households insulated. So that's good news there. So bringing us up to, up to date now, the, the, the new program, the uh, Home Energy Scotland area-based schemes. The Scottish Government has, has set aside a budget of uh, £60 million pounds for this, this coming year. They've made a commitment to it being a long-term programme, so they're looking at running this for, for 10 years. Uh, we're, making a, we're having a slightly different approach than we've, than we've done in the past. Uh, we're still targeting owner-occupiers and those renting privately, and the objectives are still the same to reduce fuel poverty and carbon emissions, but we're, we're ta targeting more households that are harder to treat. Now that we've done lofts and cavities, we're looking for properties with solid walls and rooms in the roof uh, that take uh, much more effort to get insulated. Uh, we've done quite a lot of... Uh, Marketing in the past, we've written to 37,000 households in the Bruce and Galloway promoting the first scheme. And what's particularly helpful now is that from the results that have come back from that, we've now got a database of properties that we perhaps couldn't help before because they're solid wall, but we can now go back to them and say, here's the scheme that we've got to offer now. So what we have, uh, the proposed scheme for this year, uh, There'll be four distinct projects that will run pretty much at the same time uh, that are described in greater detail in the, in the paper that, that's going to be presented uh, and in no particular order here. We'll have uh, an urban uh, solid wall project that we'll be doing in partnership with DGHP. There'll be a focus on the Dumfries Town Centre housing renewal area where there's a specific uh, desire to uh, make improvements both to the appearance and to the energy efficiency. We'll have a, a rural whole house approach. Uh, in this particular case, the, the funding will vary depending on the, the benefit status of the householder, the, the type and size of house, and the, the fuel that's used to, to heat that home. Uh, and depending on the postcode, uh, that's also a factor in how the funding comes in. So what, what we're saying is the, the scheme will be open to everybody, uh, and those that are most needy will be able to get measures for free. Uh, in, in other areas, uh, there'll be uh, external funding from utility companies that will require the householder to make a contribution to make up the difference. So the government's money will be focused to the fuel poor, and utility company money will be able to be spread a little bit wider with the householder making a contribution. Uh, the, the last point there, the free loft and cavity, uh, we'll still be doing a, a bit of that in the next programme. Uh, it will be targeted to those in uh, council tax bands A to D to make sure that those that, those that again, that are most needy, uh, the money is directed in, in, in their direction. And uh, we'll continue to work in partnership with the Energy Saving Scotland Advice Centre, who have access to funds for uh, land, private landlords and for businesses to make it a an approach that can address and help pretty much everybody. So, um, finally, really, what, what can you do? Uh, hopefully, once you've, once you've agreed to the proposals that are being presented today, uh, we need your help as councillors to raise the profile of the scheme. We're not going to be doing a massive amount of marketing. Uh, as I've said before, we've now got a database of properties that we know we can help. Um, and we'll be working with community groups in order to spread the word locally um, and if you know people in your constituency that would benefit from this scheme please uh, uh, we'll tell you how to let them get in touch with us we know that the scottish government's going to be doing some national marketing on this um, and when, not, when it's all put together we're expecting to uh, to get plenty of interest so i'll leave you um, with some quotes from some of the happy customers that we've had uh, and the UHIS scheme, including the official, the official medical assessment by Dr. Roberts of those who didn't take up the offer. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Carr. Uh, Councillor Carson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> a whole house approach, does that include uh, remedial work to 
houses that maybe don't have double glazing or front doors that are drafty or whatever. Because I always, always think that, you know, you, you used to identify windows and doors as the kind of primary uh, sources for heat loss. Um, are, are these included at all in any of these schemes? Yeah, yep, thanks for the question. Uh, these items are included. There's a, there's a list that I can, that I can have circulated that, that Ofgem provide of all, of all the measures. There's about 20 or so there that can be included. And uh, doors and uh, draft proofing and double glazing are, are included in that. Uh, the, the key factor is how much funding these, these measures bring in and what, and what the payback is uh, and how much carbon they save. But the, the approach would be uh, there'd be an energy performance certificate assessment of, of the individual property that would identify all the possible measures that could be done. We can work out the, the benefit of each of these measures and how much funding each would bring in uh, and whether we can bring in money from other sources. And then it would really be down to the householder with our advice as to which measure was most appropriate and most cost effective. But to answer your question, Anything that helps reduce energy is, is open for some level of funding. Councillor Smith. Sorry, Chair. Um, can I just ask the, the, the asking is obviously if we do agree to this, um, that one of the things we can do is to um, promote the scheme. But if I was asked a specific question, what is the criteria from a constituent, I would have difficulty answer on that question. I don't know what the criteria is. Can you say a wee bit about the criteria and what information is available just so we can assess whether or not a constituent may be entitled to apply? Uh, are you we're talking about qualifying, who would qualify? We're qualifying. We can see what the sort of four sort of rough projects are, but you, you just happen to add at the end there, for example, we'll target um, houses and council tax band ATD. I mean, that, that's, I never knew that from reading the report. Um, I just I, I try to get my head around if an individual constituent may be eligible to apply, what specific criteria do they have to meet in order to be eligible for the funding? Right. What, what we'll try to do for going live is, is to give you some more detailed guidelines, but the, the qualifying criteria are, are, are quite complicated because it, it does depend on, on postcode, uh, on, on fuel type, on benefit status, um, and many other factors to, de to de determine the extent of the funding. So basically, anybody, everybody will be entitled to some funding, but it depends on your circumstances and your location, uh, your benefit, fuel type. So there's, there's so many factors that can be taken into account. It's not until somebody applies and, and we get their details and we get their house actually physically surveyed that we can work out how much funding is available. Um, I'm sorry if that's not exactly answered your question. Because I appreciate that a constituent asks the question, you can't give them a direct answer. So, you, you obviously, I was looking at your website, and um, you obviously said we've got enough applicants for last year. That was towards the end of um, the end of the month. So you've got enough applicants for this year. So you sort of you wrote to thirty-seven thousand people. So how many people have, have basically put their put, put their name forward, if you like? How many people have you got sort of on the database? You think you might be able to help already for the new scheme? I don't have these exact figures to number. There's something like 500, pro 500 people who are suitable for loft and cavity wall insulation that we have on the waiting list. So that's part of the answer to your question. In terms of the number of solid wall properties, we haven't physically gone in and added that up, but that's something that we, that we, we need to do in order to help uh, support the bid for how we're going to break down the funding. Councillor Dempster. It's a very item specific question, but apparently, and I better not blame energy agents in case it wasn't you, but apparently, if someone approaches you for cavity wall installation and the majority of the property is sandstone, but there's an extension that's brick, you decline to do that because there has to be a, is it a 75% cavity wall insulation requirement before the property actually qualifies, which doesn't sound that clever because that element of the property will still be defective. And as a throwaway line, I thought as well that members of the public, especially elderly folk, got some support in terms of emptying their law. But apparently there's a qualifying criteria to that as well. Right. Thank, thanks for that question. I, I sincerely hope that it wasn't the energy agency 
that helped to organize this because if it was then we haven't done the job right the the offer that that we've made to householders in Dumfries and Galloway is that regardless of the the area of the property uh, if it's a cavity extension specifically then that will that will be done and if they need help emptying their loft then that service is provided where there may be this different offer is if, if there's another independent insulation contractor who's reliant only on utility company money, the rules for the utility company funding are that it has to be more than two-thirds of the area of the house. And generally, there isn't help for loft clearance. Where we've been able to make that offer is because we've taken a combination of utility company money and Scottish government money. So, so the scheme that we've been running, the UHIS scheme, has offered to do smaller areas and, uh, and loft emptying. Where people are not getting that service is where maybe somebody's going knocking their door and offering, offering a similar service, but not to the extent that we've offered. Councillor Peacock. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I'm not actually sure whether I should bring this up now or when we're going through the report, but it relates to the same, the same principles, really, because the report is generally what, uh, what we have before us here. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm sure we all welcome the increase in funding through this, this new scheme, and it's good to get this money coming into Dumfries and Galloway. Um, but in point 3.3, 3, which, is, which is part of the, one of the four projects that, uh, that you have, is the rural individual whole house approach. Um, whereas point 3.6 in the report states that every household in Dumfries and Galloway can apply. Um, now, should that actually be every rural household in Dumfries and Galloway because obviously the difference between uh, uh, the townships and, and that. So it's making it into slight confusion there as to the, the rural side of it. Um, or do we have a, a set criteria that defines a property of rural and therefore only they can apply to that specific part of the project? There is funding that's specifically available for rural areas that we, that we can access. Um, so it may be that for a similar property that's rural and a, compared with a property that's, that's in a town, we might be able to get more money for the rural property. But it still means that everybody can apply. So it's just the different degrees of funding. But I appreciate that, uh, that because we've put it in with that section in the proposal, it can be misinterpreted. First speakers first, Councillor Carras. Thanks, Chair. The two points I was want to pick up on was if we're going to have to go into every house and do, do an assessment or a survey type, how costly is that? And at the end of this, say, say this scheme was at was it fruition, all the money was spent, I think we, we were about a year ago, we're currently we're about 42% in fuel poverty in Dufferin and Galloway. What effect? Will that have a reduction or on do we have any figures in regards to that? Right. Thanks, Councillor Carruthers. One of the one of the criteria that the government has set down in their, in their in their guidelines is that they want us to be able to demonstrate the a reduction in fuel poverty and demonstrate that that this project's having an impact. So, in preparing our bid and in and implementing the project, we're going to have to be able to demonstrate that that we're having that effect. Um, in terms of sorry, what was the first part of the question? The Every house will have to get surveyed. Yes, saying, cost, much, of the, it, cost of the survey. Through what, through, what, through what I can only through what you're saying is that across the, any house across the Friesland Galloway can can jump into this or, or yeah. apply for this, so provided it's it's within council tax bands AED. And other than that, it's, is that that's is that no is that wrong? But the council tax. But every house have to be surveyed. Is that a costly thing? The last thing, if we if say okay. we've got, we're putting a million pound on this, doing what to spend three hundred thousand pound on surveys. Just what implications? That's what I'm thinking. Right. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at we've costed household surveys for for the for the current stage of the project at about fifty fifty pounds a survey. Uh, so in the in the short term, we're working on that figure. There is a need to do one before and one after, so it ends up working at hundred hundred pounds a house. So that's that's a rough idea of what we're what it's going to cost. When we go up to kind of full speed in the project, we're we're going to be putting that part of the process out to tender so it'll we'll be getting a competitive costing for that for that service uh, but to answer your question a householder that applies there, there'll be a cost of the survey but that will be taken on by the by the project
at about £100. Councillor Collins. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Mr Carr. I wonder if you're aware of any commercial companies actually using the energy agency name to get through uh, householders' doors. First of all, I've had numerous phone calls um, from people citing themselves to be from the energy agency. Um, and I wonder what measures you can take in those circumstances. And reflecting back to the earlier question regarding an extension that was a cavity wall, I'm aware of uh, one of my constituents who had a consultant out to look at their property. It's a semi-detached house. And because the contractor had difficulty drilling through the brick in the bottom of the gable wall where there's a driveway due to it being very wet, he suggested that they wait till it dries out and we know what the last 12 months of weather have been and uh, try again. Um, but it was cited at that time by that consultant or surveyor that uh, it had to be 75% in that instance of the house. And because one back wall and one fr front wall had one had been done, one hadn't been cavity wall filled, then the house wouldn't qualify. So just a bit of clarity around this criteria on the percentages. I think without 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 going over the the information again, I think if if there's a specific household or a specific constituent that you, that that you've been asked a question about, then please pass their details on to me or have them call me directly, and we'll look into each on a on a case by case basis. Um, in terms of, and I'm I'll keep picking up the second part of the question and missing the first bit. No, it was very much about your uh, name, the energy agency yes, the being energy used agency. by. Yeah, uh, we we have had problems in general during UHIS with other contractors going in and uh, um, offering a householder a similar service and giving the householder the impression that they're either with the council or with the Scottish government. Uh, we haven't heard too many saying that they're from the energy agency. I think it tends people tend to listen more if the if the council name is mentioned or the Scottish government. Uh, the only times that we can take action on that is if if the householder brings it to our attention. And our recommendation always is that they contact trading trading standards. Um, there are one or two contractors that I've been in touch with directly and and uh, advised them that you know they're trading on and the nice if they, if they misrepresent themselves. The difficulty is, if it's done verbally, uh, it's very difficult to, to tie them down. Um, but we are aware that, that some of them use uh, uh, not very good techniques to get their foot in the door with some householders. Uh, the message that we give out is that, is that we don't go around knocking on doors. That's why I said earlier we sent 37,000 letters out. You know, we've, we've had uh, adverts and bus shelters, posters up and... Uh, at the ice rink, uh, newspaper adverts. We encourage people to apply for us, and then they have a named person that is going out to survey, so they know who's going to be coming to their door. Uh, if anybody cold calls, generally speaking, they're not they're not from our organisation or one of our installers. Councillor Carson. Thanks. Uh, it's actually in the back of. Uh, what Brian and Councillor Smith and, and Debs have, have said before, I'm concerned that if it's not transparent whether you qualify or not, we will be falling into the the, the dangers of having other companies coming in. And, and I've, I've been part of that when my parents uh, were approached uh, with uh, promises of it being part of the council and the government or whatever, and the guy coming in measuring the house up and then the, the typical computer says, no, you've actually got to pay X amount and, and pressure being applied. Now, the last thing we want is, is this to happen across the region because it, it tends to be the kind of vulnerable that uh, most need this and are in, in fuel poverty, whatever. Um, if there's any doubt whether people qualify or not, I think that will actually put people off because they don't want somebody coming, surveying their house to be told at the end of it, there's, there's going to be a cost. Um, so I, I think one of the biggest exercises, the most difficult exercise you're going to have to go through is actually making it very transparent that 
yes, we will be able to come to your house and we'll be able to do X, Y and Z and it's not going to cost you anything. Uh, and, you know, particularly this 75% or whatever, that was the, the line that was fed. Again, I'm, I'm talking about my parents because I, I, I heard it firsthand. It was, you've got a brick, a stone-built cottage with an extension, which um, is a cavity, but we can't do it unless you give us X amount. And also the same story with, yeah, we'll do your loft, but you've got a heap of stuff up there. You'll need to get that emptied out first and you'll need to get your electrician to do this and so on. Or we can do it for you and it's going to cost X, Y and Z. So I think one of the, to, to give this, uh, you know, the standard it requires, I think you'll have to be really transparent when it comes to just who qualifies and who doesn't. Right. Thanks for that. Some, some very useful points there that we can build into the programme. Uh, what we probably can say is that in, in specific areas, and we can, we can produce some information for councillors so that you're clear on this, for specific uh, areas, we will be able to say in advance that solid wall insulation will be free for all these householders. That's, that's what we can do, uh, and we can be quite specific about that. Or we can say, if, you're, if your house is no bigger than a three-bed semi, or, you know, so we can be quite clear up front with, with, with these kind of statements so that you've got some general information that you can pass on. Where, where it does get complicated is if they're looking at half a dozen other measures um, and that's where we need to be flexible because there's different levels of grants and everything else. But we can come out with a very simple statement that the, the main focus about this new project is about solid wall insulation because that's what makes the biggest difference to people uh, and maybe the odd heating system here and there. So there'll be certain things where we can say this will be completely free for you up front, no extras, no strings attached because I take your point on completely we were aware of that when we did the UHIS project and we made a point of saying, regardless of age, income, tenure, uh, size of property, it's free loft and cavity wall insulation for everybody, regardless of whether it's two thirds or not, uh, and we'll help you clear your loft. Nobody for the last two years in Dumfries and Galloway has spent a penny on loft or cavity wall insulation. So that's been a clear message. So. I agree completely. We need a clear message for the new programme that says this is free for these groups of people or these postcodes. But we're doing lots of other things. So we just need to be clear on how we put the message out so that we don't put people off, but we get lots of people who, who can save you know, half the cost of the measure. We still want them to be getting in touch. But it's a good point. Thanks for that. Councillor Peacock. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, assuming that we agree the recommendations not today, when would this programme actually be ready to roll out to, to householders and, and the properties? Okay, the, we'll be ready on the 1st of April to start with the lofts and cavities because we've already got that waiting list. So uh, as long as the council's happy for us to, to make that quicker start, we've got the waiting list. Uh, and we know which householders are in, in which council tax bands. So we can be starting on the 1st of April with that. In terms of all the other measures, uh, uh, we can be starting to get in touch with householders quite early on in, in April and writing to them and getting them to register an interest and, and perhaps even doing some surveys. But we do need to uh, have a, a tender process for, for contractors that the council procurement's happy with. Um, and that may take uh, a couple of months to get that resolved. So solid wall insulation work, you know, will will not start surveying until you know probably sort of June sort of time. But we're very conscious that uh, the funding that's been allocated needs to be spent physically spent by March next year. So uh, we're we're going to be moving as as quick as we as quick as we can to get the money spent. I think the, the physical written award is something like the end of uh, May before the council's officially told, here's your allocation. But we're, we're going to be doing a lot of work before that if the council's happy for us to. Councillor Geddes. I was just to say, uh, Chairman, that, that's not entirely, uh, you know, in all fours with paragraph 3.2 of the covering report. I know Mr. Carr has said that he's just indicated that it will be May uh, before we 
we're told uh, of the court allocation, and obviously they're going to do additional proprietary work in that regard. But you know, so in other words, uh, they use the phrase uh, first of April, but you know, this will not start in first of April. Uh, it will start, you know, significantly after 19th of April, uh, if my understanding of what I heard, Chairman, is correct. Can we have that clarified for the avoidance of doubt, at least on my part? I think that's maybe where I need to bring Mr Lynch in on that, on that question. It might be a technicality that we do need some further clarification on, but we, we're certainly in a position where we're, we're happy to, do, to make a start uh, our installers happy to make a start. There might just be clarification over the funding. Yeah, um, I'm conscious that's actually part of the report. We'll cover that when we get to the report, if that's OK with you, Councillor Gareth. OK, Councillor Lever. Yeah, it's been a, a, a useful uh, briefing you've given us together with all the questions and answers, but obviously there are only 11 members of the Council on this subcommittee. So can you send something out to the other 36? Let them know this scheme will be up and running and possibly incorporate something in terms of the questions and answers which are being asked here, uh, together with the, uh, the supplemental uh, in or energy saving uh, options which are going to be available as well. Yeah, and, uh, Mr. Lynch will liaise with Mr. Carr on that one. If there's no more questions for Mr. Carr, I'd like to thank him for his presentation once again and for asking, answering all our questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Carr. Move on to item four, the Home Energy Scotland Area Base Scheme proposals for 13, 14 and 14, 15. Have you got anything further to add, Mr. Lynch? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, th this report obviously follows on from the presentation and Members have heard the detail of what the proposed programme is. Just to advise members that we were uh, notified by the Scottish Government yesterday of uh, Dumfries and Galloway's allocation as part of the £30 million um, fund across Scotland. And Dumfries and Galloway has been allocated £1.27 million uh, to deliver this scheme. And that is uh, subject to the bid proposals being agreed today and worked up for submission on April the 19th. Um, if I can, at this stage, I'll, I can take Councillor Geddes' question, if that's OK, Chair. Um, in terms of uh, the reference that Mr Carr made about taking forward the uh, referrals under the UHIS programme and saying that we're, we're ready to start in April, um, I think there's clearly a case to be made with the Scottish Government to ask, in terms of the efficiency of the programme, to ask for their agreement to essentially continue that bit, so the UHIS proposal for cavity wall and loft insulation, uh, to be funded from the £1.2 million, so we can keep that work going from April, so there is a smooth transition. In terms of the, the rest of it that is subject to procurement, um, obviously that will need to wait until We've gone through the, the due process there. But I think um, the, the UHIS element, I don't think there'd be any difficulty in getting Scottish agreement, uh, Scottish Government agreement to, to continue that work from uh, early April. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Gareth? I take it then, sir, that I have no problems with what Mr Lynch has just suggested, but I take it that that will, in fact, be uh, you know, adequately covered in the recommendations at 2.1, 2, and 3, uh, as they stand at the moment. We don't need to amend these in any way in the back of what you've just said. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Yes, we can certainly make sure that that's captured in, in the minutes as a, as, a, as a decision. Thanks. Councillor Carlos. Thanks, Chair. I think most of the questions have been asked, but I'll probably come back. I think, so 2.3, that's the 1.27 million being allocated to recommendation 2.3, is that right? I see. Right, yep. So, on the back of that, I'll go back to the point I was, uh, I was touching on earlier, 3.1 which is to reduce fuel poverty. It's got to be demonstrated that there will be a reduction in fuel poverty. I think the forecast is uh, an average of 10% increase on, on energy bills over the next three years is what will happen. Will this, will we just be standing still do you, with this, do you think, or will we actually, will we be making real-term reduction in, in uh, people's energy bills or because of what's coming in? And there's a second part on 3.6.2 where it says the second sentence is national insurance Association installers will be invited to tender for this work 
but will be required to demonstrate the extent to which the work will be benefit the local economy. How do how will we tie that into to the local economy? How will we be able to help uh, local businesses in the Priest and Galway uh, tap into that? Um, thanks, Chair. Um, Councillor Carruthers is right to raise the issue of, of fuel poverty sitting at somewhere around 40, 42 per cent for the Priest and Galloway. And that was part of the allocation formula that arrived at the 1.27 million allocation. We've got the, the sixth highest allocation across Scotland in real terms. Um, so the Scottish Government have acknowledged uh, through that formula that there's a particular issue within Dumfries and Galloway. In terms of uh, tackling the, the problem of fuel poverty and making some real progress in reducing that 42% percentage, I think the answer is it needs to be a long-term commitment. So it's not going to be tackled in one year. Um, but as Michael Carr referenced, uh, the understanding is that there's a Scottish Government commitment um, over the same period as the eco uh, funding that's in place, and that's a 10-year commitment. So over five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, we should be able to drive down that percentage of fuel poverty in terms of the work that we do. What we can't control is what's happening with energy costs. Um, but in terms of the measures, I think we can demonstrate over the long term that this program is making an impact. Um, in terms, of, sorry, what was the second part of the question? How, how can we demonstrate that it will be tied to, say, local, local businesses in the Priest and Galloway to be able to benefit from this? It's referred to, it's 3.6 point. Um, I'll, I'll maybe pass that on to Michael Carr because they've developed the model in terms of the framework agreement and he can give you a detailed answer on it. Thanks, John. We, we, we've got two approaches in mind for, for local employment. The, the longer term approach that, that, that may take some time, so might not kick in this year, is that we want uh, some sort of a, a franchise arrangement. I'll step back a bit. In order to meet the, the, the utility company's qualifying criteria, an installer has to have certain qualifications past 2030 and, and uh, Green Deal installer qualifications. A lot of small builders and joiners will not have these qualifications. So one way around that is to have a national company take them under their arm and have them do some work locally, but the national company does the ticking the boxes and signing the paperwork for them. So we're looking in the long term to set that model up so that we've got a national company based in, in Carlisle or the Central Belt uh, who is in contact with a lot of local uh, joiners and builders within Dumfries and Galloway that can go out and do that work, solid wall insulation, locally. So that's our long-term goal. In the short term, we will look at, for this year's tender, uh, having a national installer uh, put a paragraph together of, of commitment towards local employment, and we will score them in, in the tender process, and we'll, we'll liaise with the council on the wording of this um, so that they will get higher scoring for the more evidence they produce of getting local people into employment. Councillor Peacock. Thank you, Chair. At uh, 3.1, it states that the scheme will target their own occupiers and, and those in the private renting sector. Uh, how are we actually going to be able to do that, um, to get that information out to them, to encourage them to take part uh, within this scheme? Um, and will we be collating that, da that data um, as regard the grant spend and the possible benefits gained, to the, gained in, the, in that particular sector um, so that we can bring that back to this committee uh, and actually uh, have facts and figures of the actual benefits gained in the private sector rather than the social, social rented sector? Um, thanks, Chair. Yes, that's, that's exactly what we'd, we'd look to do. We'd look to promote, as, as Mr. Carr said in his presentation, uh, energy agency have got uh, quite a significant database that's developed over the last two years' programmes. We'll target that. We will undertake uh, some further promotion, not to the extent that we have done to get the UHIS scheme off the ground, because uh, there's a database there of contacts. In terms of demonstrating the impact, it'll be... Uh, the same that we've done through the presentation, the review of the UHIS for 11, 12 and 12, 13. A report will come back to this committee um, at the end of year one, at the very latest, 
um, demonstrating how many households have, 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 uh, have been approved through this measure. And certainly we could, we could do a split by tenure. I don't think that's a difficulty between the private rented sector and an occupied sector, so you can see what the benefit is. Obviously, this measure excludes the RSL sector because uh, housing association landlords have got their own responsibilities to meet the social housing quality standard, which covers a lot of these issues, and they have to fund that sector. If there's no more questions, we'll move to the recommendations. Uh, can you just clarify what recommendation uh, 2.3 would now read, please? Um, thank you. I've got a note here that that should be expanded to reflect the continuation of the UHIS scheme, being the Universal Home Insulation Scheme, um, which will start from the 1st of April, which is obviously dependent on the Scottish Government approval. Are members happy with that? Councillor Geddes? Yes, well, that one certainly, sir, but I would suggest that 2.1 should be amended to note and approve the significant increase in funding. Are members quite happy to the amendment on 2.1? And 2.2, .2, agree the proposed programme for D&G detailed at 3.3 to 3.7 of the report. Noting the programme will be delivered in partnership with the Energy Agency. Jim, we don't, we don't need that amended no, in any way on the basis of the comments that we heard earlier from John. No? Happy enough that it stays like that? Uh, I would have thought that's where the UHIS programme would have come in and 2.3 was, was possibly to note the amount of funding that was granted by the Scottish Government, or 1.27 million. My, my view entirely, sir. Yes, a 2.2... 2.2 adds in the continuation from the April 1st of the UHS programme. Are members happy with that? And 2.3 is to note the funding received from the Scottish Government of 1.27 million. Members happy with that? Thank you. We'll move on to item 5, the Common Housing Register Progress Report. After lunch, again. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, the, the only thing I'd like to uh, just kind of confirm in the report is that um, at the last housing subcommittee, the members were looking for a detailed report on the impact of welfare reform. Uh, members will be aware that there were various decisions taken at the Policy and Resources Committee and uh, uh, an extended list of significant items in terms of the welfare reform impacts that have been asked to be considered by the housing subcommittee. So rather than take the CHR issues in isolation, we're going to wrap up all those uh, issues that were identified through Policy and Resources Committee. And there's a, a special housing subcommittee being convened for the 25th of April, at which all the, all the issues identified at the PNR Committee uh, will be tabled for members' consideration. So this report looks uh, more at the, uh, the project development and, and the issues that we've been taking forward as part of the project team. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Lever. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I very much welcome the, uh, the progress which we are making with the, uh, the Common Housing Register. As we said before, previous uh, meetings of this uh, subcommittee, this has been a long time on the, uh, the stocks. I think it dates back to 2003. And um, with the uh, impending uh, car crash, which is the bedroom tax, I think it's something which you do need to uh, push forward as quickly as possible uh, in order to uh, assist those uh, uh, RSL tenants who are going to be so badly affected, I think it's going to be over 2,000 throughout uh, Dumfries and Galloway in terms of uh, finding accommodation which is suitable for their needs and means they're not paying, uh, or they're not losing out on their uh, benefits. What, what is the date? I've got a final date for the launch. I seem to remember it was going to be around about October. Do we know when this is about to go on? Uh, thanks, Chair. <laughs> the target date is, is actually September and we're still on track for that. Um, we'll advise members if there looks like there's any slippage, but so far, so good. We don't think we need to revise that date at this stage. Um, we are making quite significant progress, and we've not identified any issues that we think will uh, impact on the overall timetable at the minute. Councillor Geddes. 
Thanks, Chairman. What, what will there be the envisaged uh, stance taken by this council as strategic housing authority in relation to homeless uh, cases that we have to deal with? Uh, for instance, you know, what, what action is envisaged uh, about endeavouring to mitigate uh, the impact of the so-called bedroom tax? Uh, let me be quite honest, Chairman. Uh, I've been working with a constituent over the last few days, family and she, languishing, and I use the term advisedly, uh, in temporary emergency accommodation in Newton Stewart since last July. It's actually a four-bedroom house. Uh, and she alleges that she had a less than uh, you know, salutary experience with a member of the council's staff uh, over uh, the current housing situation. Recently, uh, the, the member of staff visited her. Uh, and one of the suggestions, in fact, that it's claimed that the, the use of the, or the, the imposition of the, of the forthcoming bedroom tax was used in a threatening fashion. And, and it was suggested that since it was a four-bedroom house, uh, and the family unit only required three, husband, wife, two small boys and a, a baby girl, uh, that, that the council uh, would, would be giving consideration or would give consideration if need be to rendering unusable one of these bedrooms. Now, uh, I'm choosing my words carefully. I've said allegedly uh, and apparently uh, that's the case. Uh, I am currently working uh, with the constituent with a view to submitting a, having a, a formal complaint on behalf of the family G, but that's not the issue. The issue is that, you know, Members of our staff are allegedly going out uh, using this, and it's a traumatic enough time, you know, for people living in temporary emergency accommodation, uh, and for those contemplating, as, as Councillor Lever says, the forthcoming car crash, uh, without, as it were, you know, remarks like that allegedly being put by council officials. So I would welcome uh, a response from either yourself or from our strategic housing staff uh, here today uh, about whether or not they uh, feel that that position is tenable and uh, re seek a reassurance in fact, at the end of the day, that uh, the council have no uh, in, in the, uh, inclination whatsoever of going down that particular route. I can certainly give you the insurance of the chair that he would have no inclination of going down that route. However, I'll leave it to Mr. Lynch to answer. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. The, the, the position that's been uh, discussed uh, internally, but obviously part of the issue is to make sure that the policy is captured properly should be one of informed consent from applicants. So in terms of uh, whether an applicant accepts or rejects an offer of accommodation that is potentially too big for their needs and would potentially then incur additional costs, um, first of all, uh, the household needs to accept that that's a reasonable offer. If the, ca if the applicant doesn't accept that it's a reasonable offer because of the potential financial position they would be left in, that should be considered as a reasonable refusal and an appropriate offer made. That should be the position. I'm, I'm reassured by that, sir, and I'm grateful to Mr Lynch and indeed to yourself for your comments. Uh, of course, it's the situation may very well be that, you know, people's uh, judgment can be clouded, you know, on the basis of any port or storm uh, mentality. I mean, the, the, the family I'm, I'm, I'm talking about actually, uh, you know, were, were tenants under a short assured tenancy and the, uh, the landlord sold the house. So they had no other option but to get out. Uh, and as I've said, uh, you know, two small boys settled at school in Newton Stewart, obviously for, you know, don't want to move elsewhere. Uh, and therefore, you know, and I would think that, you know, you, you, you could extend that. That could happen, as I say, anywhere uh, in the Fries and Galloway. And people perhaps not, their judgment being somewhat clouded on the basis of, uh, of, of wanting to stay at least in, in the community where, where they've been living and working uh, and where their, uh, in which their children are at school. So, I do take the point, and I'm reassured, but, you know, I think in practical terms, there will be occasions when people's judgment will perhaps be clouded uh, on the basis of the sheer necessity of, of endeavouring you know, to, stay, uh, to, to stay where they're comfortable in, and in an area where it's been their home. Mr Lynch, any other comments to add? <clears throat> Nothing further to add to the advice I gave Councillor Gathers previously. Thanks. Councillor Dempster. Thanks, Chair. On Councillor Geddes's point, I think we're presiding, if that's the right word, over a disaster. Over a, a, a long number of years, through no fault of their own, countless numbers of individuals have presented as homeless. We've placed them in houses where uh, there are three or four bedrooms and there are maybe single individuals. And as a consequence of our decision, because we couldn't have foresee what was going to happen, we have created a, a, a real problem that we have great difficulty in, in, in dealing with. And I see we've got a date identified for additional housing sub to deal with the welfare reform matter, but 
that data I don't think is reflected in the papers. It might be useful to have that meeting at the earliest opportunity because the car crash that Councillor Lever refers to is not that far away now. Uh, but the point I was going to ask was pretty trivial in relation to that, but it was about the, the, the Common Housing Register. Have we actually got general consensus on how that will be applied? And I, 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 I have identified one only where by lower burn housing apply a criteria for certain types of homes where they describe them as amenity homes and they refuse to accept applications for tenancy for people below the age of 30. Now, DGHB don't have that particular policy within their uh, allocations policy scheme. Have we got a consensus? I think that's the question I'm asking because it would be pretty difficult if a common housing register and then try and differentiate within that common housing register with different policies that different organisations applied in the past. That's the lunch. Um, thanks, Chair. Just to confirm, maybe some members um, missed the introduction. We've got a date set of the 25th of April for the additional housing subcommittee. That was the, the earliest date that was available in the central diary. And the recommendations of the housing subcommittee are required to be uh, reported back to the uh, welfare reform subcommittee that's to be established. That was the decision of the Policy and Resources Committee. In terms of um, the arrangements that we've got in place, we've got a, a formal partnership agreement in place between the Council and the four RSLs. That's a, a binding partnership agreement that was signed in January. And as part of that, a commitment to develop and implement a common allocations policy. So the issues of difference uh, that currently exist will not exist once we move to a, a full CHR and a full common allocations policy where the policy is applied in exactly the same way across all RSLs. If there are no other questions, I'll move to the recommendations. Uh, our members are asked to note the progress made in taking form forward the Common Housing Register project is summarised at 3.3 of the report. Are we happy to note? And a slight <coughs> amendment to 2.2 would be the addition of the words on the 25th of April 2013 at the end. Are members happy to agree that? Move on to item 6, the Housing Scotland Act 2006 Review of Scheme of Assistance 12 and 13. Uh, if members would like to note uh, paragraph 3.7, oh, wrong paragraph. Yeah, 3.7.2, uh, the Council have actually received a national winners champion uh, for the Empty Homes Championship of the year 2012. There's one nice little plaque. And Mr Lynch, have you anything to add to the report? Uh, thanks, Chair. Just one uh, clarification and correction. Apologies to members. The paragraph of 3.9.1 refers to 10 cases um, erroneously. <coughs> that was uh, a, a previous report. Um, the table at 3.9.1 is correct, and it refers to the, the three current cases that have been agreed by the Housing Subcommittee over the last year. Um, so if you can ignore paragraph 3.9.1, but the details in the table below are accurate. Thanks, Chair. Do we have any questions? Councillor Dempster. Thanks, Chair. I'm intrigued with 3.6.6, .6, and uh, it, it's come somewhat out of the blue. Although I fundamentally approve of that, it... it, it I don't know whether we've considered the whole regional situation or simply plucked another example out there. And it might be that this better fits with the derelict home strategy that we keep asking a ph and &E to bring forward because, again, it's much in the same tone, along the same lines as a derelict home strategy. And I wasn't going to, but I'll tell you about Sankar Primary School anyway. <laughs> But it might well fit into this particular arrangement as well, although it currently has no roof because I think the previous owner removed that to avoid the second homes tax. 
Uh, but nevertheless, it's how we deal with properties like that. And I don't think we can ever find a, 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 a scheme that, that covers all. But at the same time, we shouldn't pluck particular ones out the air and bring them forward as a, 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 as a, a way forward. Because I think there's a regional issue as well as a specific issue. And I'd be happy if we could have some further report on how we can develop this scheme with social landlords as well, because I realise DGHP are involved. And the, the other thing that intrigues me is, all of a sudden, it would appear that we're going to persuade the government to put this particular property, this particular region, into the SHIP, the Strategic Housing Improvement Plan, when it's not there currently. I'd like to see that in my area, and I've said that for a while, because without that, we don't go anywhere. And that's maybe for another day. Mr Lund. Um, thanks, Chair. <coughs> the project uh, summarised the 3.6.6 uh, fits within the policy that this Housing Subcommittee agreed in March of last year in terms of the BTS exceptions policy, which is summarised in 3.63, 3 3.64. Um, in terms of the derelict property strategy that, that you referred to being taken forward by colleagues in economic development. That is, that is not a derelict home strategy, that's a derelict property strategy. Um, and I'm not aware that that is focused at all on residential properties, but obviously I'll talk to colleagues about where they're going with that. What we've taken forward here is under the policy that members of the Housing Subcommittee agreed when we undertook the review of the scheme of assistance last year to look at these particular BTS properties that didn't fit with the previous criteria, but where there was a need for intervention. Um, and that's why it's been brought forward uh, for members' consideration uh, and agreement. As I say, Chair, with your indulgence, I wasn't complaining about it. I was just saying I'm sure there's more than one, and it's how we fit them on in, instead of picking them in splendid isolation. Councillor Geddes. Yes, well, I'm delighted that Mr Lynch reinforced the point I was going to make because this does in fact fit totally on all fours with our policy. Uh, it, it, Jim may perceive it as being a splendid isolation. It's a derelict uh, building at the moment. The owners have in fact planning consent to convert it. Uh, it's a public meeting. I, I won't go into any reasons as to why uh, they've not taken that forward. Uh, obviously, uh, this DG, DGHP have seen it. Wigton is a pressured settlement, as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and my opinion, uh, this is a this is a good use of resources. Uh, and were the situation, you know, to the similar situation to be obtaining uh, anywhere else uh, in Dumfries and Galloway, my view my view would be that you support it uh, unequivocally as well, as it so happens. This th 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 this particular instance is in Mid Galloway. It is a success story. I would like to think, as I say, that this committee today will agree. Uh, to go forward with it on that basis, and without leaving ourselves open to the charge of predetermination, to treat similarly all future such cases coming forward. This is a derelict property in the heart of Scotland's national boot town. It's been brought back, or it will be been brought back into use uh, to provide mid-market rent for two families. Uh, and to me, uh, it's, the, 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 it's a no-brainer if I can use a colloquialism. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll say no more than that at this stage to the time we get to the recommendations. Mr. Lever. And 3.8, the housing renewal area, the update on that. I think one thing which is missing is the uh, former seconds to go building, the conversion to two flats and two retail units, which has been held up because of an objection from CEPA. I think that had been referred to uh, Scottish ministers for a, uh, a decision. Have they made a, a decision as yet? Thanks, Chair. I think Councillor Lever is referring to the property conversions down in Friars Venel. Uh, we haven't been informed by planning as yet about the, the Scottish Government's decision or determination. But uh, as we said previously, it, it, because of the, the size of the project, it's more of a notification process. And generally, they only call in uh, planning applications that are of national or regional significance. And Certainly our view would be that that project doesn't fall into that category. We'd be very surprised if it was 
the Scottish Government intervened in the decision. But we can actually check with planning because they haven't fed back to us as yet. It was certainly my impression that SEPA had lodged an objection because of the, uh, the flooding concern. And uh, I, I think it had gone to Scottish ministers for a decision uh, on that. But if you can check that out, because obviously that impinges on any discussion you have with the, uh, the owner of the property in Brewery Street, which is even closer to the, uh, the NIF. No other speakers will move to the recommend. Councillor Carlos. Thanks. Yeah, just, it's just a small one. It's in reference to the 2.5 of the recommendations. And I go to 3.7.3 on page 17 and the last part of the paragraph says, a future policy, policy consideration of the council will be to decide whether to increase council tax on designated em empty properties in line with the Homes uh, Initiative and New Empty Homes Office of... Uh, no, a prison of New York, sorry, I uh, skipped a line. Income generation from this source could support the Empty Homes Initiatives and the new Empty Homes Office, of course. This will need to be subject to a further discussion with Community Customer Services Directorate and require a number of decisions through the appropriate committee. If, just if you could expand on that, what's the process for that? Because th that's no funded full time, like, is it? It's, we've got so many hours, so many days a, a week, I think, we've got as a part post. Just, what's the intention of that? Mr. O'Neill. I think it was the last housing sub-members agreed to extend our participation in the Homes Again project, which is the part-time post that's shared with uh, Scottish Borders and East Lothian Councils. This proposal what relates to the creation of a permanent full-time post within the Council to deal with the empty homes work. And if it were agreed in future, that post would run in parallel with the current post so that there's a sharing of expertise uh, and we would probably, the, the, the project that we're, we're in partnership with Shelter and I think that's due to come to an end at the end of the, the next financial year. So what we do is overlap the two of them if it were agreed and continue with the permanent full-time one while the Shelter project post comes to an end, if that makes sense. Mr. Dempster. Thanks, Chair. Maybe again, no for today, but 2.4, and I wouldn't want to preempt the decision on that, but it talks about uh, the contribution from council tax income on second homes. Now, when this was initially agreed by this committee, it was looked upon, for want of a better word, as a windfall that the committee could use as they saw fit to support certain initiatives. But officers seem to have found that now as a mechanism for uh, uh, determining how they spend the money. We, how much do we have uh, income annually from, currently from income from second homes, and how much is still available, if you like, for this committee to determine how best to use it? Okay. Not doing very well here with the microphone. Thanks, Chair. Uh, the income that's generated from the Second Homes Council di tax discount money is somewhere in the region of £900,000 a year, and that recurs every financial year. What the Section 3.73 of this report is referring to is the, the empty homes levy, and the Scottish Government consulted through COSLA about whether that money could and should be ring-fenced uh, to be used for housing-related purposes, and I think the decision has now been made that it won't be ring-fenced and it'll be up to each local authority to, to, to decide whatever income is generated, how that's applied locally. Uh, what this report's suggesting is that a small amount of that anticipated income is uh, used to fund the, the empty homes post. I don't have a specific problem with that, Chairman. But I'd like to know how this £900,000 that was initially used or, or, or regarded by this committee as a windfall, how much is actually available each year for members <coughs> to determine how best to use it without us waiting to get a report on what officers think they should do it. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, the original Second Homes Council tax income um, was... I'm not sure if it's ever been defined as a windfall because that's got very 
specific uh, criteria for the councils to to apply that that money mm -hmm. and it is to support affordable housing projects the proposal that Jim referred to is in addition to that another proposal that the Scottish Government are now saying councils have got the option to increase an additional levy over 100% of a charge on a property and that money is not ring fenced but the council tax second homes money is ring fenced and um, although it comes through on an annual basis uh, the housing subcommittee make decisions to support projects primarily through the ship um, and they're not they're not, they're not necessarily spent within that same financial year because the development process takes a lot longer. What we can do for members is provide an updated table on what's been agreed through this committee in terms of a, a commitment and where that's being applied. Um, so the, the proposal in, in this report in relation to the Wigton property, for example, we will have money available from the Council Tax Second Open Money to support it. Um, but we can provide members with, with details of how much has been committed, certainly since the uh, regulations came into force in 2005, and look at all the projects that have been supported through that fund. Um, so if members would like that, we can provide an update report on that. Thanks, Chair. I'd like that. I'd appreciate that. And we took Hogan the microphone. When we councillors at the time agreed to implement that charge, there were no ring fencing uh, associated with it. We had discretion how to spend that. And I would like to see ring fencing for schemes like the one in Wigton so that we can continue to support development of empty homes or, or, or low tolerable standards, whatever it might be. But anyway, happy to have that report and we can discuss it at the time that report arrives, Chair. Thanks. I'll just clarify again for members. The, the council tax second homes money has always been ring fenced based on uh, a statutory instrument and it's defined as use exclusively for affordable housing projects. So it was from the outset always set down. It wasn't a windfall for local authorities to use in any other way. That but it was never defined within the confines of, or, or the housing subcommittee or housing uh, PHSE, how it would be used until after it arrived then we started to determine how to apply it. That's the point of Councillor Thanks. Sorry for, for, for going out. I mean, are you saying that it's in legislation that it has to be spent on affordable homes? That's what, I think that's what you're saying, is it? <clears throat> yes, thanks, Chair. The, the current council tax and homes uh, income uh, is it's defined through a statutory instrument and councils have to apply that to affordable housing projects. That's, that's the Scottish Government position. And the other thing we're referring to, through the new uh, Housing Scotland Bill, that we, we currently charge 90%, I think, is it? Is it is a, and we can multiply it, we can give it 100, 110, 200, whatever. And that's the further report you're talking about, what I referred to earlier, I think. No. Um, right up until the very last bit, um, that's, that surcharge on empty homes where councils can apply an extra 10, 20% needs to be taken forward by CCS and it would be a report to the Policy and Resources Committee about whether the Council, as a policy position, wishes to apply that charge. If the Council takes that position, then what we're saying is we should, uh, if members agree it, make an argument that some of that money could support the Empty Homes Officer um, as a potential source of future funding. Councillor Peacock. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a question regarding the below tolerable standards. Um, the budget that's proposed, uh, well, I welcome as <coughs> an increase to that budget from previous years. Is that, uh, is that budget based on the fact that we have the 29 live applications currently ongoing, or is that allowing for new applications to come in within this next financial year? Is it, in other words, is it going to be enough to cover what we would expect to come forward? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, we, we've in, recommended today increasing the budget by £100,000. That's in recognition of the demand that's actually on these grants. At the moment, I think so far this year, we've, we've had around 200 inquiries. Uh, the, the figures that are quoted in the report are the number of cases that are actively going through the grant system at the moment. 
But certainly we think that £350,000 is probably enough to meet current demand, but if that money runs out, then we'd intend to come back to committee and perhaps make a recommendation that we bring in extra funding from the, 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 the Council Tax Second Home Discount Fund that, that John referred to earlier. But certainly at the moment, there, there's a lot of demand on the grants and there are a lot, a lot of BTS property issues out there that we're, we're trying to address. So it's an area that we wouldn't uh, expect to underspend in any way. If of no other questions, we'll move to the recommend. Before we move to recommendations, there was a request for a report. Can you just clarify what that was? Yes, Chairman. Um, there was a request for a report to this committee on the basically the allocation of the income from the council tax on second home. Correct. Are we happy to add that in as a two point eight? Are we happy to note the outcomes of the review schemes assistance as set out in 3.4 to 3.9? Note the progress made in relation to seven key strategic areas as set out in 3.11. Agree the budget allocations to support continued implementation of the scheme of assistance as set out in 3.12. Agree to address the shortfall of 131,000 in the allocation, allocated budget for the scheme of assistance through a contribution from Council tax income in second homes. Agree in principle to establish a new post of empty homes officer as detailed at 3.7.3 of the report, further noting that this will be dependent on council decisions in relation to the adaptation, the adoption and application of the local government finance unoccupied properties, etc. Scotland Act 2012. I agree to the inclusion of the victim property as detailed at 3.6.6 in the council strategic housing investment plan to enable this property to be redeveloped under the below tolerable standard exceptions policy. I did well, I'd normally have problems with that one. And 2.7 agreed to fund the shortfall and acquisition cost of up to a maximum of 40,000 from council tax and second homes income is detailed in 3.67 of the report. And obviously the 2.8 to receive the report. Members will be unfortunate to hear we have an extra item of business deemed urgent by myself. Uh, there will be another report will be handed out. I'll take a 15 minute recess just so you can read it. I don't think it'll take you that long, but I'll give you 15 minutes. It's now half past three, <laughs> according to the time on the console here. Uh, I take it you've got nothing to add to the report, Mr Lynch? Any questions? Sorry? Well, we agreed to put them into the, the ship. This is actually us agreeing what ones we're going to uh, deliver with the extra 1.788 million. If we no questions. And that just kind of mean we're getting a lot of money and it kind of, it's, it's how does that come out in real terms? Because we obviously we're leaving an in money along with this, this extra money and funding we've had. Say in the last two or three years, how much money have we actually had? How much can top end money, not just what we're, what we're leaving and then the whole project, what's it, what has it been worth to the economy and increasing value is what I'm thinking of. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. The, the total um, Scottish Government investment is, if you include the Innovation and Investment Fund bids that were agreed in 2011, is £15 million. If you add in the private finance that RSLs also have to raise as part of that investment package and also the money that the council are committing over the next three years it will be in the order of £35 million will be invested through the ship. If we have no other questions, we'll move to recommendations. Are we happy to note the additional Scottish funding allocation of £1.788 million to support the delivery of the Council's Strategic Housing Investment Plan. Noted and approved, Chairman. Chairman, as I've made a motion, noted and approved. Do we have an amendment? 
Yeah, if it's if it's competent to, to to make decisions on behalf of the Scottish government, then we'll go with it. It's news to me, though. I, mean, I understand we would welcome it, but how we can agree something is beyond me. That's not our decision, you know. But if that's what they want to do, fair enough. Councillor Geddes. Well, if Councillor Smith wants, you know, to have a wee session in semantics, you know, I'm up for it, uh, Chairman. Not for the first time today. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we are approving the fact that we're getting the money. Uh, it's welcome, and on that basis, that's uh, underpinning my motion. You've got a competent motion, sir. Duly seconded. Do we have an amendment and a seconder for the amendment? That would appear to be a no. So we're noting and approving the additional Scottish Government funding allocation of £1.788 million to support the delivery of the Council. Council Strategic Housing Investment Plan, and are we happy to agree to allocate the funding to support the delivery of the projects detailed in 3.3 .3 of the report, which had been previously agreed to be included in the slippage programme, noting that this will see delivery of an additional 41 units of affordable housing, and means there will be 409 new homes delivered through the Council's current Strategic Housing Investment Plan. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.